I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in St. Louis, Missouri. But thanks to hard work and the help of a lot of people, tremendous opportunities have come my way. I was able to go to law school. I opened one of the largest African-American owned law firms in Los Angeles run by a woman. I was able to start a nonprofit and give back to my community. I get to appear almost nightly on national news shows where I get to stand up for issues and speak out on things that interest us the most. And just last week, I was backstage at a talk show, and I heard this investment banker. He was yelling into his cell phone, there's no profit in nonprofits. He scoffed. He stopped me in my tracks. I almost laughed. Then I thought about the food banks providing food to hungry families, the nursing agencies providing prenatal care to single low-income moms, the pro bono agencies providing free legal services and other support to families. I even thought about the smiling faces of the kids at my nonprofit when they received their free brand new backpacks filled with school supplies. But most importantly, I thought back to one hot summer day in St. Louis when I was 12 years old. See, it can hit 95 in St. Louis without thinking twice. And with the high humidity, it can feel like steam is rising up from the sidewalks, especially if you've been standing for hours in a long line, like my brother Rodney and I were, waiting for cheese. Now, see, neither one of us would have been out there but our grandmother heard that they were giving away free cheese to families like ours in the housing projects all over the country. So grandma sent us out to get it. Rodney was mortified. But see, grandma had been shot in a domestic violence situation when she was 32. She was at her best friend's house. And she and her best friend found themselves raising my siblings and me. So they needed all the help they could get. There wasn't any work for folks in wheelchairs in those days. No handicap ramps, no special services. And my grandmother's disability check didn't go far enough to make ends meet. So Rodney and I stood in that line, waiting for cheese, probably melted cheese given that heat and humidity. Somebody in that line said this was government cheese. But they were wrong. Do you call the government when you're in need? Isn't it the folks in your local communities that you look to? Maybe the person sitting next to you? The church down the street? Your neighbor or loved one? Maybe even people in your community that you don't even know but who have come together in a nonprofit to do good. It wasn't the government that put food on our table. It wasn't the government that taught kids like me in after school programs or taught me how to open my first bank account or get my first job. And it definitely wasn't the government that taught me how to swim on the other side of town. It was nonprofits. And why does everybody call them nonprofits when we all profit. See, as a kid, I didn't know that word. And I couldn't appreciate how much nonprofits had done to improve my life. And when I was pushing my grandmother around in that big iron wheelchair, I wasn't thinking how great it would be to help others. I was thinking, I want to go outside and play like the rest of my friends. And sometimes I was even thinking, why me? But see, my life today would be a big surprise 
to that 12-year-old little girl, but not to my grandmother. She knew she was laying a foundation for me that would be like bedrock when I needed it most. And did I ever need it when my son Marty was diagnosed with autism. I was completely devastated. It took me a while before I could even say the word without weeping. And some days, I couldn't get out of bed. But gradually, thinking back to that line, I realized that when my grandmother sent Rodney and I out to stand in that line for cheese, it wasn't just about putting food on the table. It was to teach us invaluable lessons about humility, generosity, and resiliency. And thinking about my grandmother's strength, I was able to summon my own. I knew I had to be at my strongest when I felt at my weakest. And I thought about, what would my grandmother do? And I went to work. I read everything I could. I talked to health care providers, educators, teachers, parents, anyone that would provide information. I learned that autism was the fastest growing childhood disability in the country, impacting one in 64 children. I learned that African American and Latino kids are diagnosed two to four years later than their typical peers. And I learned that thousands of kids right here in our own Los Angeles community suffer to access services just because of the color of their skin. And the more I learned, the more passionate I became about trying to find a way to help others. See, I wasn't looking to become an autism advocate. But autism advocacy found me. And when I had done as much as I could do to help others, and, and I was trying to figure out what was the next step, I remembered the cheese. See, I was too young to learn the name of that nonprofit that had managed to bring all of that yellow cheese into my neighborhood. But I never forgot the faces of the staff and the volunteers that passed it out. They were doing good, and they knew it. I'll never forget the joy that I saw in their faces. So when it became my time, it, it was almost like second nature for me to start a nonprofit. I call it the Special Needs Network. Turns out, families were hoping for the services that we would bring. And now, after 10 years, we've helped 50,000 kids and families right here in our own Los Angeles community. Some may say, Ariva, it's just one nonprofit. But we've touched the lives of millions of kids and families across California. And we've helped to elevate the issue of autism in underserved communities. We've elevated that issue to a national level. That nonprofit proves that that investment banker was wrong. There is profit in nonprofits. So if you are passionate about a cause, if you care deeply about a, a group of people who you know are working to change the lives of others, do something. Get involved. And when you've done all that you can do individually, find a group of people and start a nonprofit. The impact that you will have on the lives of others is immeasurable. The effort that you can make to change the lives of others will change you in ways you can't even imagine. And if you get stuck and you're wondering, 
what the next step should be? Do like I did. Remember the cheese. Thank you. Welcome back to day two of For the Love of Community Virtual Summit. We are here. Let's see here. All right. It's good to see everybody this morning. Welcome back to day two. Uh, we had a wonderful day yesterday um, presenting nonprofit experts that talked about leadership capacity. And we talked about communications and IT and financial management. Um, my name is Dr. Catherine Adele. I am the president and founder of STC Consulting LLC and the STCC Nonprofit Network. And we welcome you today. Um, I am very, very excited about having had this opportunity to bring the virtual summit to you. And I hope you enjoyed the video, um, Ariva's story of how she got involved in nonprofit service, I think resonates with probably a number of us as we think about why we do the work that we do. And one of the things that she said that stuck out for me, um, I heard it today just kind of loud and clear, is that we are doing good and we know it. And so one of the things that our keynote speaker yesterday, Susan uh, Harris, shared with us is that as nonprofit leaders, 
we need to know who we are, be confident about who we are, and ask for what we want when we are looking towards funding. So this whole summit came about because a study came out in May of this year that shared that African American leaders, nonprofit leaders, were disproportionately not receiving funding uh, as, they, as their counterparts who happen to be white. So as we begin to think about how we could better serve nonprofits, we came up with this idea of the virtual summit to talk about a couple of things. One of the most important things in your nonprofit after formation is that you have to be prepared to grow. And so when you are growing, we call that internal capacity. You have to be able to build from the inside out. So yesterday we focused on three specific areas that we know are critically important to a nonprofit's growth. One is leadership, having the right board members in place, making sure that those boards are operating appropriately. The second was about using technology. I think the pandemic has taught us that the virtual world is here to stay. And certainly of those, for those of us that are in the nonprofit sector and the business sector, we understand that so much of our, our business, our programs and services are now dependent upon the internet and upon, and upon being virtual. So we talked about that yesterday and about the importance of having a technology plan. Then we had a panel, we had three of our, our network folks, our consultants, who talked about the different aspects of finances and financial management. So we had our attorney talk about bylaws, we had our accountant talk about your 990s, making sure they're filed, the transparency. And we had a financial services representative talk to us about how you find higher end donors to support the work that you're doing. So yesterday was expert day and today is an exciting day for me too and probably my favorite of the two because we're actually featuring practitioners today. So you're going to hear from men and women who are on the ground in our communities with community-based or grassroots nonprofit organizations. And they're gonna share with you today some of their strategies on funding. And so I want to go ahead now and start introducing our panelists. So we're gonna do ladies first. So Mrs. Kathy Norcott is with us today. She is the executive director who leads Piedmont Health Services and Sickle Cell Agency. It's a community-based nonprofit that is 50 years old this year, so kudos to her on that accomplishment. Uh, she's been involved in community health education and has worked on multiple projects at the local and state levels for several years. Recently, she was appointed to the Governor's North Carolina Council on Sickle Cell Syndrome. In 2018, her agency became the only state-funded community-based organization providing services to persons living with sickle cell disease and their families. Additionally, she is responsible for overseeing a staff of 38 individuals who provide services to more than 3,000 people living with sickle cell disease in 19 counties in North Carolina. Piedmont Health Services and Sickle Cell Agency also has an HIV Street Community Outreach Prevention Education Program in six counties and a Healthy Start Triad Baby Love Plus program that provides case management and support services to preconception, pregnant, interconception women, their children, and the fathers of their children until their baby is 18 months of age. So welcome, Mrs. Norcott. Our second panelist today is Ms. Amadi Borja. Amadi is a creative, she's a writer and mental health advocate. She joins us today having created a nonprofit organization that provides the majority of its programs and services online. Amadi founded Depressed While Black to provide mental health advocacy for people of African descent dealing with life-threatening depression. Amadi is a suicide attempt survivor who lives with clinical depression and a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. 
She first developed Depressed While Black as her 2015 Columbia University nonfiction creative writing Masters of Fine Art thesis. Depressed While Black has grown into an online community, an in-progress book, and a 501c3 nonprofit organization that donates Black-affirming personal care items to mental hospital patients. Depressed While Black envisions a world where people of African descent healed from severe depression through Black affirming mental health support and advocacy. Welcome, Amadi. All right, our third panelist today is Pastor Cedric Parker. He is the founder and executive director of the Adventist Community Restoration Center in Greensboro, North Carolina. The mission of ACRC is to restore fractured lives, rebuild broken communities, and renew hope for a better tomorrow. He joins us today representing faith-based nonprofits. Pastor Parker's formal training and certifications in Metropolitan Ministry, Executive Leadership Academy, and Urban Studies have equipped him to serve as a liaison to the community and faith-based organizations. His life's passion is to see communities, neighborhoods, and cities transformed into thriving places of hope and opportunity for those that are often underserved. Pastor Parker has been honored to be a guest lecturer at UNC Greensboro and at Elon University to share presentations in regards to faith-based community development in public health. Pastor Parker also serves as a volunteer police chaplain and sits on several nonprofit boards. And so welcome today, Pastor Parker. And then we're last, but certainly not least, is Elder Dr. Ernest Smith, who joins us today as a representative of an advise, as an advisory board member of the Entrepreneur Foundation. Today, he shares how he has successfully combined the best of the for-profit and nonprofit worlds as a funding strategy. Dr. Smith is an entrepreneur extraordinaire, ordained elder, author, national radio personality, and philanthropist. Dr. Smith's launch to entrepreneurship began with the birth of a financial services corporation that encompassed all levels of real estate and investing, insurance services, and corporate consulting. He has also owned multimedia platforms, a recording label, barbershop and salon, a restaurant, and gas wells. His professionalism, stewardship, and relentless business sense established him as a millionaire by the age of 30. His leadership qualities, integrity, and drive had been passed on to numerous organizations, enabling them to increase their profits by maximizing their operations with a cost-efficient format. Serving as an ordained elder in the Church of God in Christ is a reflection of his love for God and his word. He serves quietly behind the scenes using his gift of administrations to support the church and the kingdom of God by combining his skills as an educator, leader, and consultant. Under the anointing, Elder Smith provides oversight in the establishment of mission trips and domestic projects, both local and abroad. His business acumen supports the details of financial stewardship, revenue generation, acquisitions, negotiations, and grants. He carries a Title I mantle of ministry to be found faithful and favorable in God's eyes and before man. So welcome, Dr. Smith. So if you would, let's just welcome our panelists this morning. I'm very excited to see everyone. And um, we are going to um, have, we're gonna hear from the panelists today. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna kind of go round robin. I've got a few questions that I'm gonna ask. And then um, I'll just call the name of the panelists and uh, ask that you would all answer the questions and then we'll move to the next question. So, and I will start with ladies first. So um, our first question today is, Mrs. Norcott, I'm gonna let you start for us and tell everyone about your nonprofit organization that you lead and why the work that you do is important to you. Good morning, Dr. Agu. 
and Hello. to everyone present, to all of the uh, my fellow panelists. I am, as Dr. Adu has said, Kathy Norcott. I am the Executive Director for Piedmont Health Services and Sickle Cell Agency, which is a nonprofit community-based organization, a minority health organization. And we have been in existence for the past 50 years. Like most nonprofits, Piedmont Health Services and Sickle Cell Agency was started out of, of, of a tragic, tragic situation. A family lost a, mother, a father and a child within six months of each other to, due to complications of sickle cell disease. Mom could have just waddled in her loss, but instead she wanted to educate the community. She wanted more people to learn about sickle cell disease, understand what it was, because she found herself with her neighbors telling their children that they could not come and play with her children. And she did not take it lightly that they were saying that because they didn't know, they didn't understand. So she wanted to make a difference. So at that time in 1970, the Triad Sickle Cell Anemia Foundation was born for the purpose of providing education, counseling, and testing. Originally, they would go into the communities and test people for sickle cell, specifically for sickle cell trait, because persons can have the sickle cell trait and not know that they have the trait because there are not a lot of symptoms associated with the trait. So in most cases, that back then, a number of people did not know that they were carriers until they had a child with sickle cell disease. And sickle cell disease can be very painful for individuals because as they go through um, what's known as a pain episode or a sickle cell crisis, the red blood cells be become sickled and they clog up their blood vessels and they start having excruciating pain. But more importantly, when this clogging occurs, there's deprivation to the va various organs and parts of the body that we need in order to function, our brain, our heart, uh, our kidneys, everything about us. And for a person living with sickle cell disease, these pain episodes can come and they can go. But what it leaves behind is the uh, deterioration of their body. So over time, they may have what's known as necrosis, um, bone, death of the bone. Um, strokes are very high among per children up until about the age of 15. That's not to say that adults cannot and do not have um, strokes, but it does say that we are more concerned with the children originally. Things have changed. You've heard that there are, that persons with sickle cell disease have been cured, but the problem continues to be that there is no universal cure. We still continue to have babies born with sickle cell disease. Our agency is here to raise awareness about sickle cell disease, to help persons living with sickle cell disease live the best quality of life that they can. Dr. Adu mentioned in my bio that we also have an HIV program where our HIV program was born out of the concern of our adolescents living with sickle cell disease because they knew and they understood that blood transfusions are a treatment sometimes for persons living with sickle cell disease. So right around the time that Arthur Ashe, the African-American tennis pro, was diagnosed with HIV after receiving a blood transfusion, many of them became concerned. So out of their concern, we created a peer education group. This was back in 1992. We taught them about HIV. We gave them the facts. We dispelled the myths. And then we uh, arranged for them to talk to their peers because we know that adolescents, teenagers, they listen to their peers. We want them to listen to us, but we always realize they don't always listen to us. So if we can equip our young people with the facts and know or encourage them to share the facts, then we stand a better chance of our teenagers learning what's right. So from there, we received funding. By 1996, we were throughout Guilford County 
providing street community outreach, education, testing. Today we're testing in the detention centers, the Gifford County jails, we're, the test, we're testing in substance abuse facilities. Our agency has tended to address the health disparities in our community. So we address those conditions that are affecting our community. We started our HIV, um, not our HIV, our Healthy Start Try It Baby Love Plus program because of the increase in infant and maternal mortality in the African-American community. So that's why we're working with women. It is alarming, it, was, it became very alarming to me when I started looking at the statistics and then talking to cl uh, clients actually, how many women in 2020 don't get prenatal care? How many women in 2020 do not get postpartum care, which have both have been indicators for why the infant mortality and maternal, maternal mortality is so great in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. So that's our agency in a nutshell. I could talk all day about our agency, telling you stories about our agency, but I'm sure in a few minutes, I'll, in a couple of seconds probably, I'll get the flag that I've been <laughs> on this question for so long. But my passion, in 1977, I needed a job. Triad Sickle Cell Anemia Foundation gave me a job. I'm still here at the same agency. That name has changed, but the agency has just simply grown out of the need in the African-American community. I did not know what sickle cell was. I did not understand what sickle cell was, but I know that I'm placed here at this agency been here 44 years. I still like my job. I still love my job. But more importantly, I love the people that I work for and that those persons are the ones that are our clients. I have a wonderful staff. Don't get me wrong. I have a wonderful staff. But being able to help empower individuals to make a difference in their life, to accept a tragedy, and I say that in quotes, because sickle cell disease at one point might have been looked at as a death sentence. HIV may have been looked at as a death sentence, but because we're here, our agency is here to provide the correct education, provide the counseling and the support that helps, that empowers an individual to say, okay, I got this, but it does not have me. And to empower them to pull themselves up and to go on and in, embrace the life that God has given them to make it better. And as long as we can help them stay focused on why they, why they exist, I think will make a difference. If we don't address the health disparities in our community, I don't know who will. So in addition to those programs, we also have a free health screening clinic where we actually test people for HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, sickle cell. We t do diabetes screening, we do cholesterol because we know those things are crucial in our community. We are dying from diabetes. We're dying from cholesterol clogging our veins. Um, we are dying from hypertension, high blood pressure, all of which can be controlled with some proper education, counseling, and support. And thank you. And thank you, ma'am. That's so powerful. So, Imadi, I'm going to pose the same question to you and the prompt and ask you to tell us more about Depressed While Black and why this work is important to you. First, I just want to thank uh, Mrs. Kathy Norcott for the work that you're doing. Um, I have the sickle cell trait. Um, my father is Nigerian, so my life is shaped by sickle cell. And wow. your work is just phenomenal. Thank you so much. Uh, and I just look up to you um, as I'm running a baby nonprofit that literally just started. Um, I just am so inspired. 50 years, that's incredible. Um, thank you. <laughs> So um, for Depressed While Black, um, 
it's been a journey. Um, I have dealt with severe mental health challenges uh, for such a long time that I really thought it was impossible for me to do the work in, in, in the real physical life um, outside of online because I just, it, I, my life has been kind of a wreck to be honest. And I hope that encourages folks that you don't have to be in a perfect place to you know, found a nonprofit. Um, I was diagnosed with clinical depression back in 2012, and I started talking about my experiences navigating the mental health system as a Black person around 2014, and I was simply just trying to look for other Black folks out there who had my similar uh, condition, and I was just trying to keep myself alive by finding community. And then that turned um, into uh, me speaking and me advocating for Black people living with severe depression. And eventually it got to the point where I, I noticed that there is a, a really s a serious need out there. Um, during my second hospitalization, I felt like such a burden to my mom and, and my loved ones that I told them, don't visit me in the mental hospital. I'll you know, stick it out on my own. And because of, that, because of that, because I didn't have any visitors at the mental hospital, um, I didn't have any type of uh, black hair care items for my hair um, because the hospital do, does not provide that. Um, I didn't have any type of moisturizer for my skin. Um, I didn't have you know, any type of covering uh, for my hair at night. And it really uh, affected my self-esteem and my confidence. And in the mental hospital, how you look determines how you're treated, unfortunately. And the more that you present in, I guess, you know, a dignified um, and socially acceptable way, um, you may get a, a earlier discharge date where you get to leave the hospital earlier. Um, you may have access to more uh, hospital privileges. Uh, because I didn't have any clothes uh, during my second hospitalization, um, I wasn't allowed to walk to the cafeteria. So I had to actually uh, get clothes from the lost and found. And it was really kind of a degrading experience to wear clothes. I don't even know where they came from. I'm a Pan Carolina Panthers fan. I had to wear Dallas Cowboys slides. It was so demoralizing. I hate the Cowboys. So this, this is what I had to deal with right there in my second hospitalization. And so I didn't want that to happen to anybody else. And so what I did was, um, I went to a local mental hospital in the area in Greensboro, and I just asked them, you know, what do the patients need? Uh, this was back in January, before nonprofit status, before anything. I just wanted to do it. And so I started donating back in January, and I developed a relationship with the mental hospital in Burlington, where I would speak with a staff member, and they would tell me every month. Uh, what needs that the patients have. And what I noticed is that a lot of the needs that patients have are things that we can easily purchase every single day, like chapstick. The patients are desperate for chapstick because if your lips are chapped, you don't think about nothing else. Um, some of them really want flip-flops. Um, some of them want, you know, menstrual care because a lot of these hospitals, they're not giving quality uh, menstrual care items. Um, a lot of them want just flip-flops, things we could buy at the Dollar Tree. And so I uh, purchased those things um, every month with the help of donors. And just with the help of SDC Consulting, um, I caught up with the paperwork because I was doing the work <laughs> of a nonprofit before actually getting the 501c3 status. And so with the amazing counseling and services and support for SDC Consulting, Dr. Addo, um, I was able to, you know, be a nonprofit, which allows me to, you know, ask for donations. And uh, recently, uh, we were able to raise um, around $1,600 with the help of another nonprofit that's mentoring me being, uh, that's the name of the nonprofit. And so right now, um, I'm, I, I donate to two uh, mental hospitals, um, but I'm actually trying to expand nationally. Um, and I'm working with, this is, this is just a mind-blowing thing, but it's, it's coming full circle for me. So actually the first uh, psychiatric hospital that I was admitted to um, actually reached out um, and I spoke to the resident doctors and talked about my experiences. And because of that, they want to, uh, me to be involved in providing kits, black hair care and black skin care kits. 
um, for our patients. So we're in the process of doing that. Um, and it's just been an absolutely amazing journey where I have not been ready for anything. I was, I'm, I, I've never, I'm not ready for it, but I, I just go, I just go for it because I know that the need is so great that black patients need to be treated with dignity, love and support. And they need to know that people that are on the outside are thinking of them. And so, yeah, this has been an amazing journey and I'm just so excited for what's to come and so excited for for applying all of the tools that Dr. Adel and STC Consulting has provided, so yeah. Oh, wonderful, that's exciting. That, congratulations, that's very, very exciting. Um, wow, that just really touched me, thank you so much. Okay, Pastor Cedric, we're gonna hear from you now, sir. Tell us about ACRC and why this work that you're doing is important to you. Uh, good morning again, uh, Dr. Ado, and uh, good morning. I'm just so inspired by the uh, the panelists so far, Amadi and uh, Miss Kathy. Um, great stories. Um, again, just in awe of just this opportunity. And um, so the ACRC uh, is kind of born out of a a need um, growing up, um, like uh, the the TED talk talked about on the other sides of the tracks. Um, I grew up in a, in a neighborhood that did not have a lot of resources. Um, and in doing so, I uh, found myself in some situations where I um, didn't always make the right choices and the right decisions, right? Um, hit the streets, as they say. And so uh, through that situation, um, in 1999, I lost my best friend to gun violence. Uh, his name was Lamar Barrett. Um, he didn't have a father in the home. He loved basketball. And, um, and so throughout that journey, um, the, the aspect that really uh, touched off the most was my dad. And so my dad always kept me in church. And so um, after I gave my life to Christ, uh, God started working with me. And um, the issues that we face in the African-American community, uh, the, the brokenness so often that we see, um, your zip code should not determine your success. Uh, your zip code should not determine your opportunities. And so we started to look at how could we better serve um, our neighborhoods and, and the East Greensboro area. And so um, the ACRC was, was born out of that desire, um, uh, thanks to SEC Consulting and, and the numerous folks who um, were just willing to give. And so uh, what we do is we focus on economic empowerment, educational advancement, health and wellness, and character and leadership. And so I kind of uh, this may be a spoiler alert. Um, if you've never seen the movie Black Panther, at, at the end of that scene, uh, you see uh, Takala uh, um, with a group of kids in Oakland, California, and they're playing basketball, the same neighborhood uh, that the, the, the beginning of the movie starts off. And um, that's where he discloses who he is and also the opportunity for the children to learn about technology. And so uh, we believe that if you bring these resources um, from a needs-based and an assets-based approach that we can transform lives. Um, I think about my friend Lamar Barrett who loved basketball. What if a basketball program was in this community? What if he had an opportunity to have uh, access to a STEM program or access to mental health or access to uh, things to, to help him better care for himself or even character and leadership mentoring? And so um, when we look at these um, opportunities, uh, that's what we kind of do. Um, so that was also born out of a desire in 2013. Uh, we had an emergency city council meeting here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, there was some shooting downtown. We had about 400 youth um, who were just kind of just, just all over the place. And so they enacted a team curfew. And out of that, uh, we partnered with a number of different uh, churches and organizations uh, to do a um, uh, it was called Walking for Change. And so we, we partnered with the police department. We got downtown, we had conversations and we kept hearing the same things. Uh, we need to have, you know, our, the rec centers open. We need programs, we need services. And so um, that was a part of us coming together to provide those opportunities. And also in 2014, um, we uh, were able to kind of see the report that Greensboro and High Point uh, was number one in food insecurity. And so uh, we started a, uh, an outreach called Park and Praise. And uh, we, we had some community partners come out. And one of those partners 
uh, with Second Harvest Food Bank. And uh, through that partnership, we were able to connect um, and um, with our weekly food distribution program, uh, we were able in the last four years to give out um, over a million pounds of food. And we're also uh, partnering with a number of different churches in the community to continue that um, offering um, dinner meal distributions uh, since um, March uh, to, to those who are still in need uh, since the COVID crisis. So we're just excited to continue this work and uh, we just look forward to sharing with you today. Okay, thank you so much. You know, y'all have me tearing up over here and, and I do appreciate you all just sharing your heart and, and, and being so transparent. I think for those of us that are committed to this life, um, this, is, this is who we are and this is what we do and this is what we're called to do. So Elder Dr. Smith, we're gonna bring you on in now, sir. And we would like for you to tell us about the Entrepreneur Foundation and why this work is important to you. I'm just so excited and inspired by the work that all the panelists are doing, Kathy and Amadi and Pastor Cedric. It's certainly exciting to know that the next wave, the existing wave, uh, where we've come from, where we're going, what it is that we're doing is actually having an impact and making a difference throughout the world. And that serves as confidence to me to keep moving and doing what it is that I'm doing. The Entrepreneur Foundation has been around for several years now, and it was inspired by my personal journey of not being able to gain employment uh, as a youngin way back when, uh, getting all the degrees and education and going through the matriculation of what it is that's expected in order to uh, be on top of your game and get the college education and the advanced degrees. And uh, you'll come out and you'll get a good job. Well, what's a good job? Well, a job with benefits. Get somebody to pay the benefits and get that steady paycheck every two weeks and uh, some FICA dude is going to take stuff out of your paycheck and uh, you'll be set for your retirement. And maybe if you keep your head down and keep your nose clean and about 40 years or so, you'll walk away with a gold watch and some type of pension <laughs> of some sort. So I bought into that American dream and was like, OK, well, this is what I need to do. I followed the steps. Uh, my parents were there and they supported me and encouraged me. So I did what I thought was right and then got out and had the certifications and the paperwork and the degrees and the experiences, but nobody would hire me. <laughs> Everybody said I was overqualified or underqualified or undeserving. I don't know if it was racism. I don't know if it was socialism. I don't know what the issue was, but nobody would give me a check. So I got very depressed and frustrated and upset and then I had a conversation with my father. He was a general contractor and uh, spent his whole life doing that. Uh, Beaver Brothers Incorporated. And for 30 years owned his own contracting, general contracting business. And he said, son, everything that you need is in the house. Whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you desire, your purpose, your passion, it's already on the inside of you. It's your responsibility now to take that, to cultivate that, to develop that, and go out and get your ship. Stop waiting for your ship to come in. Stop waiting for, Stop waiting for somebody to, to give you something, but put on your big boy britches and go out and get it. So that ushered me into the world of entrepreneurship. So it's like, okay, I, 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 I see, I, I, I hear you. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to invest a life's work into entrepreneurism. And that's literally what I've done. I've never worked for anybody. I've never gotten a W-2. I've never gotten a steady paycheck every two weeks. I've never uh, had some FICA dude steal money out of my paycheck. Uh, I never had anybody pay for health insurance or anything. Uh, so I just went ahead and uh, did what I did what I do. I started in the financial services uh, industry and uh, had my own agency and uh, at a very young age was making six figures and uh, everything was going wonderfully well. And my journey was so exciting because 
I was actually doing what it is that I wanted to do. Set my own hours, was able to come and go as I please, but I had to work ethic and education to provide the stability that I needed in order to generate revenue. So one day it was like a light bulb went off. And it was like, well, why don't other people do this? Because obviously I, I talk to people and, and I have spheres of influence and people in my circles and stuff. And a lot of them were punching that proverbial clock, but they were unhappy, they were unsatisfied. Uh, they wanted more out of life. So it was like, well, how come you haven't done this entrepreneurial thing? How come you don't engage in entrepreneurship and, and, and what is it that is stopping you from living a life of purpose and a life of passion? So that's when the Entrepreneur Foundation was birthed in providing support and undergirding that support of entrepreneurs. Because life is too short. The graveyard is the richest place because that's where dreams go to die. So people have a heart and a passion for a thing. People are purposeful in what it is that they do. So if we were able as an entrepreneur foundation to provide support to entrepreneurs, which literally make up the largest economic stream in these United States, how wonderful would that be? To be able to pour into people and to provide business plans and strategies and, and all of this for free to entrepreneurs to help them develop their gifts, their talents, what it is that they've been called to do. The reason why they have been birthed, life is too short. So if we're able to tie in, to pour in to these individuals that have a heart and a passion for a thing, giving them the ability and the option to fire their boss, should they so decide, what a wonderful world this would be. People would be happier. People would be able to control their destiny. People would be able to go out and get their ship versus waiting for their ship to come in. And people would be able to live a life of purpose and passion. Because if a person doesn't do that, then people like me, people like you become void of the gifts and the talents and the reason why they were born. We're all born for a particular purpose and reason. Live out that purpose, live out that reason. And oftentimes we find that birthed in the era of entrepreneurship. So how wonderful our journey has been to be able to provide programming and provide education and training and provide virtual uh, workshops and provide meeting opportunities and networking opportunities and, and barter exchanges and billionaire mindset masterminds uh, to be able to help entrepreneurs recognize and understand that they too can live a life of purpose and a life of passion by the support of an entrepreneur foundation that literally serves as a dream catcher catching their dreams and cultivating their dreams and developing their dreams and getting what it is that God has purposed in their heart to do to another level. So we're excited about the work that we do. We're excited about entrepreneurship. We're excited about the creativity and the ingenuity that goes involved with people living what it is that they've been called to do. So that's what fuels us. That's what gets us gassed up in the morning. That's what gets us, you know, on the phone and raring to go because it's a <laughs> world when you have to get up and say, it's time to make the donuts, but yet you don't want to make any donuts. So do what it is that you've been called to do. And through the help, the support, the education, the training of the Entrepreneur Foundation, we pray that your living is not in vain, that our living is not in vain, and we're able to provide you the support that you need to help grow your entrepreneurial endeavors. Thank you, sir. And you'll see in the chat, you're getting all the amens this morning. <laughs> and for those of you who are participating, we are going to give you an opportunity to ask them some questions too. I've got a, some questions lined up for them, but we want to give you access to this powerhouse panel that we have today. Um, and I'm sure that you can see why they have all been invited. While there is, they all are doing something different, but they all really have a heart to serve. And Sheena Beasley, I'm full too. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, second round, Robin. Back to you, Mrs. Norcott. 
please share a little bit more? I know you, you kind of tapped into some of your programs, but I want you to basically share with us the programs or services that have the most significant community impact. And, you know, we're coming, well, I don't know, some might say we're coming out of a pandemic season. Some may say this is going to continue. We're certainly kind of in a new normal. And I would like to say this too, that these four individuals have been able to grow, prosper, and finance their nonprofits in a pandemic. So this is another reason why they're here today. So let's hear from you, uh, Mrs. Norcott. And uh, you need to take your, your uh, open your mic. Okay, yes. There you are. All right. All so, right. I, you know, that's kind of a difficult question because Sickle Cell was started out of need mm -hmm. in the community. And the agency rose to that calling. Mm -hmm. We got involved in HIV because originally, as you remember, HIV was being um, communicated as a gay white man's condition. But yet the rates were growing in our community. We had stuck our heads in the sand and was suffering from the not me syndrome. It can't affect us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we stepped up to the plate to be able to do that. There was an organization or there were organizations that were addressing the case management and support for persons after they got HIV and eventually AIDS. But there was not a, enough going on to try to prevent it, okay? So there was no cure. There's still not a cure, uh, but it has, the numbers have decreased. Uh, and I have to, I pat us on the back because we identify less people now with uh, HIV. We're still finding people with sexually transmitted other conditions, <laughs> which <laughs> lets us know that they're not fully understanding that they need to protect themselves. Uh, but as so, and then baby love, it just kind of fell in our lap. But just being able to address health disparities in the African American community and being willing to tell the truth uh, about those conditions and helping our people move from the not me syndrome till it might be me. What can I do to protect me and to protect others? Um, we rose up for the COVID. We found a way to be able to provide testing in our clinics. Now, no, we're not testing hundreds of people. We're not doing the drive-in, you know, events like you hear with the health departments. We don't have the capacity, but we do. We were able to find a lab that we were able to work with. We don't have to pay for the kits but we're able to offer this particular test that's growing rapid again in our community. We've been able to identify people who normally would not have taken an opportunity to get tested. So we just tend to see what is affecting our community and then we look and see if we have the capacity to do it. We listen to our client base. We do annual assessments, we do semi-annual assessments, but we take the time to listen what is it in, that's affecting you, affecting your family that you think we can do to help you? So we, we just look at what's happening in the immediate community. Sickle cell disease being labeled as an African-American condition, nobody's really, there are some, I'm, not, I'm just saying right here in our immediate community, I'm not saying that there are not other agencies that do sickle cell services. That's not what I'm saying. But we don't have as many looking at sickle cell disease as we have looking at cancer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's been labeled a black man's condition. We're still dealing with stigma related to sickle cell. We're still dealing with mistreatment in the, in the medical community as it relates to sickle cell. 
And without our agency and similar agencies like ours to keep it in the forefront, now recently there was a uh, White House roundtable to address sickle cell. Uh, there were some clients there, some parents there. But as far as I'm concerned, it was just a political ploy mm -hmm. uh, to try to get people to get out and vote a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, they promised to give money for research to find a universal cure. It continues to be less than any other orphan condition that they are providing monies to. Wow. So we just try to step up to serve the community where we see the need. And we don't always address health disparities. We don't address the fact that when an African-American presents to the emergency room how they're treated. When our, when our young males especially go to the emergency room, they're in pain. When you're in pain, you want pain relief. When you're in pain, you might need a narcotic. But when our young men get there, they're in pain. They ask them what they have. They tell them that they have sickle cell disease or they have sickle cell anemia. Oh, you just want some drugs. It's, it's nothing wrong with you. So we have to continue. And the condition was identified in America in 1910. It was in the 1950s when they figured out what was happening in the body, the mutation, where it occurred, why it occurred. But we in 2020 still being mistreated. Wow. And that's because of the pigmentation of our skin, not because of the condition that we have. So we just step up to the plate to try to make a difference in our community and to do what we can to make people aware Racism is rampant and it's in all kinds of different places within our community. It's not just in police brutality. It's racism. You're being mistreated when you go to the emergency room seeking care. Mm -hmm. When you have to try to mask your pain. I have, we have clients that struggle to put on makeup before they go to the hospital mm -hmm. so that they won't be perceived as just coming off the street. Ooh. How many of us really, when we're in pain, we want to get up and put on some makeup? I know it's supposed to make us feel better, but when you go into the emergency room and you're almost in a fetal position of pain, caused by pain, that you can't get rid of and that you've been suffering with for a couple of days because you didn't want to go to the emergency room because of how you knew you were going to be treated. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that, that's what keeps us going. That's, mm -hmm. what's, what, that's exactly what keeps us going. When I said I love the people that I work for, mm -hmm. I mean that. Yeah. You know, uh, 44 years, Yes, I've seen some deaths. Yes, I stood in the, in the room holding a mom's hand when they disconnected her six-year-old from life support, who two weeks earlier had attended our summer camp and had been running around like any normal six-year-old. But because of the condition that she had, she suffered a, a massive stroke. And two weeks later, she was dead. But then I've been to some graduations. I've been to some weddings. I've been to um, uh, uh, weddings. I've been to some divorces too. But I've been to I, I've been to so many life supporting, encouraging situations, you know. And with I started the adolescent support group because I wanted to know when do I start talking to the children. I've been talking to the mama since the babies were born. When do I start talking to the children? Because they have to take this thing and they have to decide, am I going to let it dictate my life or am I going to dictate it? So I'm thankful that we had 
seven graduated from high school this year. All of them went to a higher place of education, some two years, some college. And yes, I got masters that have graduated with their masters. They got some good jobs, you know, some are uh, just trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, but who's not? What young person now is not trying to figure it out? But that's the passion behind it. What keeps us going is really addressing the needs and the disservice that is happening in our community and trying to make a, a difference in that. And, and I thank you for that. Um, I'm getting just a lot of response. Uh, people are really being appreciative of the transparency. And I hope that as uh, the attendees are listening, that this is resonating with you about the power of the work that we do. You don't need 15 people on a board to, to have an impact in our local community. What you, you do need is some tenacity <laughs> and some <laughs> perseverance. And uh, to me, Kathy Norcott just exemplifies that. And, and her passion is still strong, strong, 44 years of service, and she's still on fire and still serving. And so I've just been so inspired by her. Uh, what she won't tell you is that they had, this agency has um, provided a quality of service that actually has funders asking her to take over programs so that they've grown to seven sites because they've shown a willingness, she has shown a willingness to serve the community and allow the nonprofit to expand. And so it has grown kind of on its own. And then she didn't tell you about the sickle cell walk either. But anyway, there's so <laughs> much that they do. <laughs> but Imadi, I'm going to pose the same question to you. And I don't want the fact that your nonprofit is young to have any bearing on your answer. So I'm asking about your programs and services and, and what do you think that you're doing that has the most um, important, significant community impact? And what I really would like people to know about too is how the vision for creating the nonprofit in a virtual space, because this is really a, something new to our, to our nonprofit world. Yeah, um, yeah, similar to Mrs. Norcott, there's definitely a lot of health disparities when it comes to Black folks navigating the mental health system. And that's definitely been something that I discuss um, online. So basically what I started was just sharing my experiences online, uh, what it's like to be Black and navigate the mental health system. And Black folks, a lot of us, um, we are more likely to be admitted into inpatient services um, and other uh, highly disruptive care um, compared to white folks who are oftentimes more tracked to outpatient, which is a lot easier if you have a job to kind of go to, um, as well as therapy and medication management. Um, and so that's a lot of the things that I was talking about um, because uh, a lot of, uh, Unfortunately, a lot of mental health organizations, um, they don't include a lot of Black faces um, in their campaigns, um, in their discussions, um, in their conferences, and there's so much that's missing in the conversation. And so my start with the Press While Black was just addressing what's missing in the conversation. Well, what's missing is that when it comes to police brutality, um, Black folks with mental health challenges are getting the brunt of that. Uh, with the recent loss of Daniel Prude. Um, there's, there's so many different situations where uh, Black folks experience punitive care in the mental hospital system, um, where they're being punished if they're not 100% compliant, whether that is they're not unwilling, like my situation where I didn't want to take a medication that I didn't feel like was relevant to my diagnosis because I was misdiagnosed. Um, I was told that I had bipolar uh, because uh, I, I, I laughed with my friends and I wrote in a journal, like literally that was it. And I didn't wow. want to take the medication that they prescribed because I didn't think that I, it was due to an accurate diagnosis. So I just simply uh, talked about these experiences online because I felt like people weren't talking about what happens after you ask for help. Sometimes after you ask for help, you don't get help. And 
you know, what what happens? What what can we do to close these these health disparities so that black people are given care and they're not being confronted with the police um, when their family members or loved ones called 911? And so that's where I just started. Just what 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 are we not addressing when it comes to black folks receiving care? Um, and then, you know, I just started recognizing the fact that um, a lot of the services also um, that people provide, uh, a lot of times black folks with severe conditions can't really access them um, because, you know, if you can't really get out of bed, it's really difficult to, you know, go to a psychiatrist that's three bus buses away. Um, it's, it can be really difficult. And so I started noticing, okay, what's, what's not available? What's, what's not there? And I started noticing that when Black folks are um, being admitted to mental hospitals, their cell phones are being taken away. Um, so they don't have access to these amazing webinars and these virtual, you know, like they can't do online stuff. And I started thinking about that as well. Like, how can I provide services to a group of people that are being disappeared and being placed behind locked psychiatric doors? And so with the support of donors, with the support of my fellow Black community members who have been hospitalized and know what it's like um, to be separated from your family and, and friends um, in these places, um, we started kind of raising money. And this was all online. Um, I, it was, everything was online. And so, you know, I basically said that, hey, like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it whether you donate or you don't donate, I'm going to purchase personal care items for mental hospital patients. We'll focus on uh, Black mental hospital patients. This is what I'm going to do, and I would love your support in this. And I, I would say, you know, 100% of the donation goes to these funds. Um, I often post online the receipts so people know, like, I'm actually purchasing these items. Your money is actually going to these places. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll lay out all of the, the personal care items that I donate um, on my mama's table. I was living in my mama's house for so long, y'all. And I'm so grateful for my mom, like literally letting me take over her house with all my boxes and all my stuff. Um, but yeah, I would just lay out all of the, the items that I donated and say, hey, this is what you've done. This, this is, here it is. And, you know, sometimes the pictures are not pretty because I have my huge mask on my face shield and I'm at the Dollar Tree looking crazy. But I think that providing that kind of behind the scenes content online has been really instrumental um, because I think people are looking for something that's authentic and, and that's real right now in the pandemic yes, because we are suffering, Black folks are suffering so much. Um, I don't think so, they're looking for this, you know, perfect aesthetic. I think they're looking for, okay, where is my money going and is it go actually going to the place I want it to go? Um, and so, yeah, online, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook has been really instrumental. And also just getting ideas as well from people, um, because I'm also hoping to expand to another program where I provide support to people um, who are looking for a therapist. And that's one of the biggest things that I'm hearing right now with the pandemic is that it, it, exasper ex it exacerbates people's mental health symptoms and conditions. Even if you don't have a mental health challenge, you can get one during this pandemic because of the stress of unemployment and death and disease and all this stuff that's happening. And so, yeah, through online is almost like a focus group. And that's what, you know, Dr. Otto was telling me, like, use your online community as a focus group, send out surveys. So I sent out a Google form and asked them, you know, what other programs would you like from Depressed While Black? Uh, what, 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 how do you want us to serve you even more? And so that's kind of the next step for us. And that's basically all online is where I'm gonna help people look for a therapist. So I'm gonna create a form, they fill out this quick form, and then according to the criteria, um, I searched through a lot of different Black uh, therapist directories and provide uh, therapists that are compatible uh, to their needs. Uh, so online has been so pivotal um, in assessing the need, um, pe people communicating that need to me, and also providing that need. Awesome. And I think this is really, um, you know, I'm, I, little becomes much in the master's hand, as we know that's been said. And so, you know, the impact, the potential for impact 
is still very much there with what seems to be a small idea. And then you kind of get it out and let people see and realize that there are a lot of people <laughs> who, who are interested, who will support. And, um, you know, I just thank you so much for the work that you're doing, Amadi. You're really talking about something that I still think is a little difficult in the African American community. And you're providing a valuable service just by educating people on the need and helping us have an awareness. So thanks so much. So Pastor Parker, we're gonna roll on to you now. Um, tell us about your programs and services and, I, and identify for us the ones that you feel have the most significant community impact. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Adele. And um, so yeah, I think the, the food distribution program um, that we started uh, with a number of different community partners and um, I'll, I'll back up and then come back. So just kind of what I've been hearing the whole time um, just confirms uh, this saying that I, I, I really love. It's pain comes before passion. Pain comes before mm -hmm. purpose. And a lot of times these efforts are born out of, um, of our own pain or of our own uh, brokenness. And so I just, I just love hearing these stories. And so for the food distribution program, one of the keys uh, uh, to this service has been partnership and collaboration. And um, uh, as they say, uh, collaboration is better than competition. And so we work a lot with a, a number of different churches and community partners uh, to provide um, uh, weekly food uh, for families who don't have dinner. And so um, for the COVID crisis, uh, we recognized that uh, there was a gap um, in the, the dinner meals uh, in terms of the, the school system. So they provided the breakfast and the lunch. Uh, there was no dinner. And so we got together with about three churches saying, hey, we're going to start small. We're just going to do this uh, two days a week. And um, like you said, uh, little becomes much in the master's hands. Uh, we are up to 10 churches now. Uh, we're in Rockingham County and also doing some expansion, uh, probably to Montgomery. And um, it's just been amazing to see all these partners come together to help meet the community needs when it comes to food insecurity here in Greensboro. Uh, we're also looking to launch in the next couple of weeks a, a project called Love Sinks. And so uh, there's a ministry down in Atlanta uh, that helps with uh, providing sanitation stations for uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness. And so we're looking to partner with the um, Interactive Resource Center to set up uh, two sanitation stations for those who are experiencing homelessness to be, a, be, be able to provide them with, um, uh, able to wash their hands and to just to feel uh, that the, the dignity that you know, God has given us uh, so that they can feel uh, that, they, uh, that they matter because uh, each person in this crisis, uh, we take for granted that we are able to come inside, take a shower, you know, put on some clean clothes, different things like that. A lot of folks uh, who are experiencing homelessness may not have that. So we want to make sure uh, we take care of that. And also, um, we're partnering with the um, workforce development to do a, a drive through jobs fair. And so I think this is pretty cool um, coming in the next, uh, I think, three weeks. And um, it's going to have uh, employers um, out Amazon, uh, also, I think FedEx and, and some other different opportunities, uh, voter registration uh, will, will be taking place that day as well. So we want to make this a community event. Uh, we know that during this time and then this crisis that uh, specifically in our neighborhoods, we don't get access. Um, like Dr. Smith was saying, um, if, if, you, if you don't have that ability to go out and, and, and get your own, bring your boat in, uh, sometimes you need to bring those resources to people in the community. And so we want to make sure we bring good, high quality paying jobs to our communities uh, to give them the, the resources that they need to continue to take care of their families. And um, also that, that STEM uh, component has been a very big thing of ours. Last year, we were able to partner with North Carolina a and uh, to provide a summer STEM program to, to children uh, in our communities. Again, going back to that whole Wakanda um, theme, um, there is a church out in California that started what was called the Wakanda Initiative, where they brought STEM programming to their community. Um, they brought 
uh, the robotics kits. Also, they got permission from the local um, municipalities to, to be able to shoot some rockets up in the sky and all these things uh, for the kids. And it just really made an impact. Uh, so much so that they did an expo. Um, they were able to kind of dress up and um, they, they, they had all the props, uh, the, the pastor dressed in the, 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 the African garb and it was really, really cool. And um, they actually, uh, the city is uh, Mount Rubido and they actually named, uh, they had a day designated called Mount Rubido Day for this church uh, because of this Wakanda initiative. So we wanted to kind of bring that here uh, in the spirit of uh, kind of uh, some of the um, urban practitioners like Nipsey Hussle trying to bridge that gap between Silicon Valley and the hood. Want to bring those resources together. And last, um, uh, the family and youth empowerment event that we were able to host last year at the um, at the at the mall, which which was pretty cool. Uh, we brought you know in the summertime, there's a lot of things that can happen. You have the the summer slide in terms of education. Uh, you don't have the access to uh, quality summer programming. And so we brought a number of different motivational speakers, uh, some, some gang experts. Uh, that, that was amazing. Uh, literally, we're having this speaker talking in the mall, and uh, we had active gang members literally come down and talk to this young man and try to get involved in this program. Uh, we provided everything from, you know, from basketball. We had churches out there who uh, gave their – um, information about the programs that they do during the summer and so we fed them we had some chick-fil-a out there uh, so I think that was really 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 cool um, and, and, and one more thing and, and then um, uh, that will be it so the, the one thing that I really am passionate about that I hope transpires this year is also on what's called the peace games um, that's a basketball program that will be geared toward uh, reaching um, gang uh, youth that are involved in games and pretty much um, bringing them together around the auspices of, 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 of sport. But then after leaving that, making sure they have access, whether it be something that, that, that gears them toward entrepreneurship or, or gives them a job um, that allows them to continue to, um, to leave that life behind. And so uh, we want to work together with the police department as well as the Greensboro Swarm to see how we can put that together. So that's in the works as well. And that's near and dear to me because of uh, my friend who was uh, lost to gun violence. And so uh, those are some of the programs that we're looking to offer this year with um, the Adventist Community Restoration Center. And what you all hear with him is, is I see it popping up, is um, Pastor Cedric has really caught on to the power of collaboration. So he's been able to really tap into identifying need and then quickly find collaborative partners to help him expand. Pastor Parker, how old is your nonprofit? Uh, I believe a year and a half. So there you go. <laughs> so with some strategic planning, he has an excellent board. All of these organizations have very strong board members to help give support. Yes, a year, a year and a half. <laughs> so Dr. Smith, talk to us, sir. Um, share some programs and services that you feel have had the strongest community impact with the Entrepreneur Foundation. I love, 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 love the information that's being shared. There is a need that this, And when you have people fulfilling those needs and being a blessing to the community and giving back in so many different ways, it is exciting. It's exhilarating. Mm -hmm. and I don't know about you, but it makes me excited to be a part of a panel such as this a part of a virtual summit such as this. We have a, I guess, a not so unique structure. We follow the McDonald's uh, brand. You have McDonald's Corporation. They are a for-profit entity, but then they also have Ronald McDonald House Charities. So one of the strategies from a tax perspective that they're able to benefit from is to be able to take their for-profit money, invest it into their nonprofit organization, in order to provide services uh, to the community. So the same type of thing we do with the radio station. So WDRB Media serves as the for-profit entity 
for the nonprofit of the Entrepreneur Foundation. The for-profit helps to fund the nonprofit. The for-profit helps to engage and gain access into various community structures so that the Entrepreneur Foundation can now provide services. So the things that we are excited about is our partnerships with such things as Standing Up to Cancer, when we're able to participate in 5Ks and you see 3,000 people uh, running around and vendors and a couple of dozen food trucks and able to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for organizations like Standing Up to Cancer. Uh, Pastor Cedric talked about collaboration. We believe in collaboration over competition. We need to collaborate. <laughs> We need to work together. We live in this dog eat dog type of society, my way or the highway, everybody trying to be the big boss in charge. Well, we need to get out of our comfort zones and partner with other individuals because together we can do so, so, so much more. Uh, we partner with um, not only Standing Up to Cancer, but Ronald McDonough House Charities. We participated in their benefit concerts where we brought in major international uh, recording artists and, and raised close to about $500,000 in this community alone for Ronald McDonald House Charities. Uh, All Things Possible Ministries we've collaborated with and did independent artist showcases and collaborated with other celebrities and raised over $100,000 for, I believe, a, a young man that needed about six operations. He was two and a half years old and needed help and support and health insurance was not funding 100% of the bill. So we we were able to partner and be able to participate and help raise funds and market and advertise and, and get our other entrepreneurs involved. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So as entrepreneurs, as individuals that are part of the community, people need to know that you care, that you share, and that a portion of your resources are going back into community good. One of the other things that stand out to us, uh, in addition to our, co uh, our collaborations with Standing Up to Cancer and Ronald McDonald House Charities and All Things Possible Ministries, uh, our participation with Feed the Children, bringing in a couple of 18 wheelers and feeding 5,000 people up in the university area of Charlotte. Um, I got to give a big, big, big shout out to God's Outreach, uh, the City Church up in Huntersville. Uh, we've partnered with them for a myriad of different events that actually have a major impact in the community. And I believe because of our partnership, because of our collaboration, we were able to touch many, 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 many more lives. So instead of having something, a little something, something, for example, we do a, a, a Christmas in July, a Christmas in August, where we give back to our young people as they prepare to go back to school. And, and we reach about 500 of them. And we're able to give them brand new backpacks, back to school supplies, feed them and their families all a hot meal, over a thousand hot meals given away. Well, we're able to do that because of the collaboration, because of the partnership. Yeah, we can do a little something, something on our own and maybe help 10 children or maybe in Thanksgiving, give away a, a dozen turkeys. But how wonderful is it to give away a thousand turkeys? to feed 1,000 people, to feed 5,000 people, to have a greater impact because we believe that that excitement, that that energy rubs off onto other individuals so that they themselves will get ignited to do something in their community, to partner with other people, to make a positive change and a positive difference. Uh, we do a... Um, a, a, a end of year Christmas celebration uh, where we actually, this past Christmas, 2019, we actually provided Christmas to 2,000 families. Uh, the, Dr. Rideau was a part of it. Uh, we got our other entrepreneurs and partners a part of it. And we're able to give away bicycles and give away toys and give away uh, cell phones and playstations and basketballs and footballs and, and to actually provide Christmas to 2,000 people that under normal circumstances would not actually be able to have anything under the tree type of scenario. How wonderful and exciting uh, that is. Uh, so a lot of what I'm sharing with you, those links, I just passed, I just uh, posted uh, where you can search in YouTube. Uh, I, I put it in the chat. So if you actually go to YouTube and you search uh, WDRB Media Annual Christmas Toy Giveaway, uh, event highlights. If you search WDRB Media, loving our community. If you search Jam Fest, love to uh, the community, you'll actually see video footage 
of us giving back. Once again, we don't do it just to say, ooh, this is something that we do. We do it to help inspire other people so that they know that, hey, you, you, you can either do it yourself or you can partner with us or you can partner with other people. At the end of the day, do something. Get up off of the rusty dusty and give back. Be a part of the community and be able to be a blessing to somebody else. The days of us four and no more, uh, me, myself, and I, those days are long and gone. Uh, we're now in a new century where we need to be able to be our brother's keeper, to help our brothers, to give back to our brothers and sisters that need our help and our assistance. Uh, the end of this month, we're excited about a another jam fest that we're doing Th this one's going to be a little bit different a little bit strange for us because we have to incorporate social distancing because we want to be socially responsible so we're going to have uh people that are six feet apart and and we're going to be wearing the masks and the hand sanitizers and things of that nature but we feel that the need, even because of COVID-19, is, is the need is still there. The need doesn't go away. So yeah, we're dealing with a pandemic and things are going on and social economic uprisings and Black Lives Matter and, and all of these issues that we're dealing with. We, we, we're in political season. Uh, so people are trying to figure out who they're going to vote for and stuff. Well, you know what? The community still has need. So how wonderful is it? for us to show up on a Saturday, September 26th at 12 noon with bells on to be able to love on the community. You know, we're, 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 we're accustomed to, to loving on people and hugging people and, and embracing people and showing the love of Christ. So uh, this, this time it's gonna be a little bit different for us. So we don't know exactly how that's gonna play out with, with, with the love and the, and the time and the attention, but we, we gonna figure it out together. We're going to all show up and we're going to be giving away bikes. We're going to give away prizes and iPods. We're going to feed folk. We're going to be throwing basketballs. In fact, we're going to take some cash and we're going to stuff some cash in some water balloons and we're going to slingshot that into the audience so people can walk away with cash. So if you want cash, if you want bikes, if you want hygiene products, if you want Bibles, if you want games, it's going to be a time for you to come out and celebrate even during a time such as this. People are hurting. People are crying out. So if we can be there to be able to show God's love, to be able to show joy, to be able to show excitement, that is something that we believe is our reasonable service. So as the Entrepreneur Foundation, we take our resources, we take our time, our attention, we collaborate with other entrepreneurs and we create events such as this to be a blessing to the community because they're crying out. And if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? And if not for this cause, what cause? It's our responsibility, not the government, not, not, not other, and it's right. our responsibility to be able to love on our community, to give back to our community, and to provide the resources that they need to be able to live a wonderful life. So those are the different types of things that we do in order to give back to community and to be able to document those things so that it provides excitement and it ignites the fire under other people to get involved and to do something. Thousands of people, we have the ability to impact every single year and give away thousands of dollars and give away prizes and gifts and toys just to put a smile on somebody's face. And all of that is simply to say, we love you. Awesome. I tell you, this is a powerhouse panel right here. <laughs> and, you know, when I thought about putting this group together, I was very meditative about who to bring together. And, and we can just see now that, you know, this is just a divinely ordered time. So everything that's being shared is just so on point. And I hope that it's being instructive and inspirational too. My last question, because I really do want to try to, to leave some time if people have questions, is to share successful funding strategies that have helped the nonprofit achieve its mission. And I think actually Dr. Smith um, has really given us one very power, powerful strategy of how you can be an entrepreneur, establish a nonprofit organization, because the IRS sees those two as two separate entities and they see the founder of the two as a separate entity as well. Um, oftentimes our counterparts have been able to financially understand how to navigate 
what are legal and accounting types of principles that will give them access to cash. I love the nonprofit form because it is built to run on OPM, other people's money. So that it is, it's, it's a business form that is built to run off of the donations, whether they're cash or items, in-kind donations of other people. And what happens is that once we kind of understand how to get this paperwork right, and once we focus more on developing collaborative relationships, we're going to see the fruit of that. Because here's what I know about the African American community. Giving and doing for community is in our DNA. Nobody has to teach us as a community to take care of each other. We know how to do that already. What we're, the next phase for us is learning how to do that and having more money coming in so that we can impact more people. My mentor told me that money follows ministry. So as we do the work in the community, and for those of you all who have a vision, and you know that it's a God vision, we, we know and understand that God does not provide a vision. He, he is going to give provision. There's provision and protection already in place when he asks you to do something. So don't let me get to preaching. But anyway, so last question, Kathy Norcott, funding strategies that have worked for your nonprofit. There you are. I I you. We got you. <laughs> <laughs> Funding strategies. Well, let me explain that. Although I've been at the agency for 44 years, I've only been in this seat, and I call it the seat of executive director since 2017. So I had not always had to be concerned about the finances. My uh, uh, my executive director prior to me, who handed me this job, not handed it to me, but groomed me for it, used to tell me, you need to pay close attention to the budget. All you do is spend money. And I would just respond, well, I'm responsible for programs. You're supposed to get me the money to, to support the program. So now I'm on the other side. So I have to look at things differently. So I have tried to position us to be in more partnerships, to be a better collaborator. Um, because I was in charge of the programs, I've always tried to make sure that our programs really had good outcomes and impacts. What I'm learning with seeking money is the funding stream, the funding ideas are changing. At one point, people wanted to just, you reach a whole bunch of numbers and they give you money. And now they want to see impact. They want to see the impact. They want to see some outcomes. So what? You tested 2,000 people. Did you really make a change in anybody's life? So trying to make sure that we are in a position to back up what, I, what we say to be able to show uh, the impact of the difference that we're making in people's lives, the difference that we're making in the community. So one of the strategies, rather than always being concerned about the whole agency, I'm looking for the programs or the thoughts that funders are interested in supporting and being able to be strategic about where and to whom we request money from and why we're requesting it. So it used to be just do street outreach uh, for HIV, but they wanna know more now because people are living longer with HIV. So why? What difference are you making? What else are you doing for that person, for that family? And then being able to adapt to what's going on in the, around you. So. For seven years, we've had a sickle cell run walk. 
it was concentrated in Charlotte because that's where one of our offices is. That's where it began. That's where it was. We'd had some others in the past, but they hadn't been as successful as the one in Charlotte. But this year, thanks to COVID, we could not do it. But because of the climate, we had to figure out what to do. So our walk is virtual this year. And because of that, um, I've had to learn some new things. Am I doing very much with it? No, because I don't understand technology. But what I've learned from Dr. Adu is that you surround yourself with people who know what you don't know. So, uh, and fortunately, I was able to look into um, our client base and identified a young man who has his own marketing firm and worked with him to help us pull together the things that we needed. We have an IT person, an IT manager, but he's just one and we have seven locations, so he can't do it all. So I had to look out. able to get some things so being able to align yourself with the right people to be able to help your dream so i decided i wanted to do a, um i've been wanting to bury this capsule to celebrate our 50 years I, the intent was to do it on june 19 as a uh, world sickle cell day and i couldn't do that and september is national sickle cell month and i it's got to be buried it's just got to be buried so it's going to be buried tomorrow but thanks to Keystone Marketing, I'm sitting where I am right now with the 60-inch TV that's going to be up. And we'll be live on Facebook. We got a YouTube station. Uh, one of our younger staff has set up an Instagram. Do I know how to access all of that? No. But what I did do, my strategy was to surround myself with people who share my passion share my understanding and are willing to work with me for my dreams because I can dream. I can think up for some things to do. I don't even know how to put them to fruition, but I do know how to identify people that are willing to join me in my dreams and help me make it work. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'm excited and I got my postcard too. So I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she sent postcards out to tell people, get ready for the time capsule. So yeah, because everybody's that's, not on social media. Some people still need a piece right. of mail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, Imadi, successful fundraising strategies. How are you getting the funding for these um, items? Yeah, so the interesting start uh, to the Presswell Black, the nonprofit, was that I was operating as a nonprofit before I was actually a nonprofit. <laughs> um, and so to, to handle that kind of lack of paperwork, um, I teamed up with the fiscal sponsor, uh, being the organization that I mentioned before. And it was so great because uh, we were aligned with our values. And so even if the organization was bigger and had way more experience, we, we wanted the same thing. Um, we wanted Black people uh, to feel, uh, have dignity and have support as they navigate the mental health system. And so we created a campaign called um, Build a Black Vision. And um, through that Build a Black Vision campaign, um, we wanted to defund the police and to use that money and more into Black community support. Um, so we basically created a vision for, for the mental health system that we want for our people. Um, and a part of that uh, building the Black vision was the program that I do, the Mental Hospital Wishlist Program. And we said, you know, hey, if you want to build a Black vision, if you want to start a new future for Black folks dealing with mental health challenges, donate to this program um, because we're trying to create a world where every Black patient is treated with dignity. And so I was able to uh, leverage and utilize uh, their, their larger uh, social media platform and presence. And it was just an amazing time because uh, Beam actually received um, $25,000 from Wells Fargo. Uh, they were uh, featured at, in the BET Awards. They had like a, a brief uh, video commercial. Uh, I mean, and then they also were given, I believe, over $200,000 from Jordan Peele. Um, so 
it was amazing to see, witness you know this organization uh just have so many wins have so many successes just back to back to back and even though i just started i was a part of it in some way because we were building this campaign together um and then you know we wanted to so we raised the money through that campaign um but we also wanted to um get people to not just be donors, but to also be a part of the movement and to support what we're doing. And so a lot of the donors and the people that got involved, um, we, we utilized that activity to create a committee to dismantle uh, systemic racism in the mental health system. And so we had our first committee meeting um, a couple weeks ago and we utilized their activity and their, and their support to see if how can we create um, a, an imaginative space where we can imagine better mental health support for Black folks, have better maternal uh, mental health support, um, better crisis care. And so I think the one of the powerful things that you can do in that, that, I, that hopefully that I'm doing is that I'm trying to get donors to be more than just donors, but to actually be people who are a part of the world and who are collaborate um, and help build vision together. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And for those of you I'm listening and we're typing in here, Amadi, um, how did you get connected with Bean? Online. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, I just, I just talk about my experiences and, and through just sharing my experiences, um, people can see my values and see ways that they can join in and be aligned with the work. And so um, Yolo, Yolo Akili, who was the founder of Bean, um, just really appreciated my work in uh, donating um, items to mental hospital patients, especially Black folks, and just wanted to be a part. And, you know, I told Yolo, like, I ain't got the papers yet, uh, so <laughs> what can we do? You know, you got a 501c3, I don't. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, Yolo, what he did was set up a, a giving portal on his website and said, you know, all of this money that you donate will be given to the Presswell Black in the Mental Hospital Wish List Program. And so that's how it started. But it all started online. Excellent. So literally, like, did you send him, a, did you DM him and say, hey, or just how did that happen? YOLO reached out to me. So um, he found you in the virtual space. He saw absolutely. your social media. He absolutely did. He said, hey, you know, Minority Mental Health Month is coming up in July. Um, I have this idea to collaborate with you and to raise money for your program. And that's how it worked out. All right. Oh, thank you so much. That's exciting. All right. Coming on around to you, Pastor Parker. Funding strategies that have helped your nonprofit achieve its mission. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Again, just uh, a wealth of information out here. I'm taking notes on, on this end. I know, well. right? <laughs> um, so basically, uh, for me, it was a mindset shift. Um, coming into the nonprofit world, uh, you always hear the, um, the, the things thrown out like, oh, you know, all you need to do is go out and get grants, right? And so uh, finally figuring out that, you know what, only about 10% uh, of probably your um, your income to your nonprofit or your donations will be uh, through grants. And so the, the other 90% being individual donors. And so we really kind of focused on, uh, you know, fundraising. And one of the neat things that uh, we were able to do, uh, which I highly recommend if you have a social media platform like Facebook or Instagram, is to get that um, donate button added to uh, your nonprofit. Um, it opens up a, a world of possibilities. Um, so for example, like Giving Tuesday, um, so Facebook uh, participates with uh, the Giving Tuesday um, event. Uh, that's the first Tuesday after Black Friday. I think this year is like December 1st or something. And uh, there are matching funds involved. And so if you're a part of that, if you signed up, if your nonprofit raises money, uh, they will, if you get in on time, uh, potentially match those funds for your nonprofit. Uh, one of the cool things that uh, we stumbled upon uh, is the Facebook uh, birthday fundraiser. And who knew, right? And so for example, um, you know, you have a lot of friends on your Facebook 
uh, page. Some you engage with, some you may not. Uh, but your birthday rolls around, Lord willing, once a year. And so people might not get you a gift, right? And, you know, you're in your, you know, your 20s, your 30s, right? All those things are passed. But they will, uh, it seems, donate to a cause that you are really want, wanting to support. And so one of the cool stories, um, I reached out to a, a friend of mine who battled uh, a rare form of cancer. Um, a few years ago, and I reached out to her with the expectation of starting a birthday fundraiser, and she said she would do it. Um, I think Facebook sets your initial limit at $250, so that's what I'm thinking, you know, in my mind. Okay, this is going to be a fundraiser. Every dollar counts. She sets her amount at $1,000. So I said, okay, and within 24 hours, she's already at $800, so I'm sitting back. I am I'm blown away. I'm praising God. And um, so she decides that she's going to move her goal up to $2,000. So I said, you know, we'll see where this goes. And uh, she has about a week for this uh, Facebook fundraiser. So she gets to that point where she's almost raised $2,000. And then she gets more audacious and she raises it again. And so uh, now we're going for $3,000. And we're, con we're having a conversation in the, in the messenger. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Look at what God is doing. She was like, listen, I'm praying. I'm asking God. And uh, on, I think, the Friday before the fundraiser ended, I believe, on that Monday, she texted me. She said, you know what? This is it. $3,000. i am done. I don't like fundraising at all. Praise the Lord. Here you go. And uh, went to bed that night and got up. And lo and behold, she raised it again to 4000 with two days left. And we're sitting back here thinking like, okay. There's no way, right? Look at this. This is this is just something crazy. And uh, by God's grace, uh, she put a post on again right before the deadline, and we were able to raise over four thousand dollars in about a week on a Facebook fundraiser. And so that I wanted to share that with you because it's the power of the power of technology and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising. And so I, I highly recommend um, you know you get in that donate button and also looking at the Facebook fundraisers. Uh, crowdfunding, which is a, a new um, term that's out there. Uh, please go out, kind of do a little research. That's a next, uh, I guess, wave in, in terms of uh, raising funds online. And uh, one of the, the things that we really wanted to do with our volunteers um, is to be able to um, take that relationship as a volunteer and engage with them and hopefully uh, build a relationship to where you become a donor. And so we were very intentional about reaching out to our volunteers with our food distribution programs and other programs to let people know this is what we're doing. Uh, we love you being a part of a, our organization and volunteering, but here are other ways that you can uh, help our organization grow and continue to do the work in the community. So those are some of the strategies that we followed. And uh, we were also thankful enough to get a, uh, a substantial grant with the CARES Act. Um, Dr. Doe has always preached and that stayed in my mind that you need a bucket. When, when folks are giving away money, you need a bucket <laughs> to put it in. And like you said, Almighty, having that 501c3 status does make a difference. And so having that paperwork, getting those things in creates opportunities uh, for you to get the funding uh, when folks are cutting those checks. All right. Excellent. And we're going to roll on to you, um, Elder Dr. Smith. We've, we've got a few more minutes here. Um, if you'd share with us, please, successful funding strategies, and we know you, you talk specifically on the business side, um, but if you can share something else, some other tips for us, we would be appreciative. I'm excited about the information that has been shared, that is being shared. I sit in a unique seat because a part of our funding strategy is to provide coaching and consulting for other entrepreneurs. So by providing coaching and consulting to other entrepreneurs, which once again is our passion, they then in turn help fund the Entrepreneur Foundation. So it becomes sort of a micro economy that we create where we give to them, they give to us, we give to them, they give to us, we give to them, they give to us, and that wheel sort of goes on and on. So one of the things that we figured out early on in uh, the life of the Entrepreneur Foundation is that uh, begging for money did not work very well. 
So when you go knocking on doors and saying, please, 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 oh baby, please, I need this and I need that and can you please? It does not work very well, especially when those doors get slammed in your face, especially when people say we've already given, especially when people say, oh, uh, check us out next year when we renew our budgets and things of that nature. So we have found it successful to be always giving something hey. to someone in order to get something from someone. So we always went in with our hand open. What can we provide? What services can we give your organization? What service can we provide your for-profit? And then through those services, be able to raise funds for the Entrepreneur Foundation based upon the services that our board, our advisory team provides to other organizations and corporations. So that has been probably the most successful uh, that we've been able to do. So we serve on several boards, we serve on several committees, and because of the advice and the counsel that we provide them, they then in turn support the organization and are able to use that as a tax write-off. One of our other successful funding opportunities has been through providing marketing and advertising for corporations that we serve. One thing that we notice is that when going to companies and asking them for donations, they have a charitable gifts budget line item. And typically that charitable gifts budget line item is the smallest line item on their performa. Uh, sometimes it's about 10% and that's about all they give. And once those monies are exhausted, that's it. So they can take those monies and give it to Habitat for Humanity, give it to Ronald McDonald House Charities, give it to Goodwill. We're not the only kids on the block that somebody can give money to. So how do we differentiate ourselves from these other wonderful organizations that provide such good? Well, I got into the mind of the for-profits and thinking, what is it that a for-profit needs most in order to help grow their organization? And the answer given was marketing and advertising. So now as a nonprofit, we're able to approach for-profit corporations, ask them for money, but instead of just giving them a letter saying, thank you for your donation, your tax deductible donation, here's our 501c3 information to write it off on your tax return. Well, if you don't have any money in your charitable gifts line item, well, guess what? Take it out of your marketing and advertising budget take it out of your continuing education and training budget. So now we started tapping in to other budgetary line items that these corporations had to be able to help fund the Entrepreneur Foundation. So you can keep giving to where you're giving to, but because we're providing you a service uh, through training, through education, through counseling and coaching, helping to undergird and support your entrepreneurial endeavor, you then fund that, that money goes to the Entrepreneur Foundation. But in addition to that, if you do any marketing and advertising with us, because of our for-profit, WDRB Media, the radio station, we're now able to get on the airways and literally tell the world of your generosity, tell the world of what it is that you're doing and that you've done and why do you do and how long have you done it and how can people support you and follow you and things of that nature. So through radio, we're now able to shout out the individuals that now support the Entrepreneur Foundation. And what we have found out is that, hey, they would love to get the tax write-off, but more importantly, they would love to get the advertising with us letting the world know how wonderful they are and what it is that they're doing as, an organ as a corporation to support nonprofit world. So through that, they then fund the Entrepreneur Foundation because it's more than just a letter. It's more than just a pat on the back. It's more than just a thank you, but it's an opportunity for them to share their story and to drive traffic to their for-profit, which then in turn generates more revenue for them, which then in turn allows them to give us more money, which then in turn allows us to now promote them, which in turn allows them to make more money, which then in turn allows them to give us more money. So we've created this creative uh, microeconomy where we support you, you support us. We support you, you support us. And that wheel goes round and round. 
We're also excited about a barter exchange uh, that we've established where people can actually barter products and services. And through those exchanges, a percentage of that goes to the Entrepreneur Foundation. So we've created a network, partnered with other barter exchanges. We have about 6,200 businesses that are a part of the exchange. And when they exchange services one with another, a certain percentage of those revenues now go to the Entrepreneur Foundation in order to help our work and to help us to be able to give back to the community. Uh, so bartering has been successful for us, providing uh, counseling and coaching services have been successful, providing marketing and advertising services to entrepreneurs has been successful. We even get a we partner with authors uh, of books who then will sell their books and give us, the Entrepreneur Foundation, a portion of those proceeds to help once again fund our initiatives. So we partner with authors uh, dealing with certain subject matters. I have a book called Birth in the Greatness Within, Discovering Your Purpose and Passion for Living. Uh, I have Overcoming Fear and Procrastination. I have Broke Walks, Money Talks, Making an Investment in Yourself. So through these book sales, I'm able to personally take a portion of those proceeds and reinvest them back into the Entrepreneur Foundation as well. Uh, so doing that kind of stuff on some of the boards that I serve on, as it relates to nonprofit world, one of the things that we do is we have brainstorming sessions where we actually have a whiteboard and it's white and it's clear and no suggestion is a stupid suggestion. Throw it all out. So we basically just regurgitate everything that comes to mind about how we might be able to be creative and think outside of the box when it comes to fundraising. And then as the discussions continue, we then narrow down what that is. So for one organization, it was crowdfunding. Uh, as Pastor Cedric had mentioned, uh, there was a GoFundMe page that one of our organizations had set up and they raised several thousands of dollars through their crowdfunding uh, uh, fundraising initiative. That's what they wanted to do. Uh, that's what they did. And they raised thousands of dollars as a result. There was another organization that we work with. Uh, they have a nonprofit daycare organization and they were looking to transport children and already had a van but needed another van. So at the end of the day, uh, the answer was ask. 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 We have not because we ask not. So they went ahead, put together a letter and they started asking for a, uh, a van and from, from different organizations, from different car dealerships and things of that nature. And guess what? They got it. They got them a, a 30, a 32 seater uh, bus, mini bus uh, to be able to now transport children just because they opened up their mouth and they asked for the support that they needed. I serve with other organizations that will do an annual uh, fundraising gala where they come together and they celebrate achievements of other individuals and uh, charge tickets and raise funds that way and give away gifts and prizes and that kind of stuff. So I've served on boards that have done that. Legacy giving is something also that uh, nonprofits ha that I've worked with have engaged in where they actually will set up um, informational sessions with life insurance agents. And through the life insurance agents, they now benefit because they're providing education and financial stewardship but then they're also doing a needs assessment with regards to the individual and the debt that they have to determine a specific amount of life insurance that they would be able to have to cover their family. But in the beneficiary section of it, it's already agreed upon upfront that 10% of whatever the face value is of that life insurance policy now gets donated back to this nonprofit that's making these services available to these individuals to get the life insurance that they need. It's what we call legacy giving. So through that, a person could take 10% of their life insurance proceeds and donate it back to the organization once they pass away. That's etched in stone. So now the organization is receiving monies from a wide variety of areas as people pass away, because that's one of the things that we gonna do uh, the sooner or later. But when that happens, once again, if they support what it is that you do, then they are able to give in that regard. There's another organization that I work with and we do a give uh, one, one of the giving methods that we have as Entrepreneur Foundation is through an organization called Give Lafai. Givelify is able to receive donations and is able to uh, track those donations and give back receipts and things of that nature. Well, they have something that's called Givelathon, 
whereby you can have a uh, program set up where people can give through Givelify to your particular organization and you can set goals and you can track it. And uh, same way you have your, um, uh, the, the uh, HBCUs uh, and, and, and how they fundraise through different telethons and stuff. Well, this is through social media, if you will. So it's not really a telethon, but more so a Givelathon, where it's done through a giving portal to 501c3 nonprofit organizations. Uh, so we've been able to engage in that as well. Uh, we also do networking events with entrepreneurs to allow them to network with other entrepreneurs, but then we also have them pay a fee, a vendor fee, to be able to set up and sell their goods and wares, but those proceeds then go back to the Entrepreneur Foundation. So we have a number of different ways that we fund the organization and give back to the organization, but all of that cannot be done without the help and the support of other individuals. Because at the end of the day, it's your heart, it's your passion, you are your best brand ambassador. So you always have to be on front street. You always have to brush your teeth, uh, have some mouthwash, a little mint in your mouth, uh, take, take, take the crust out the side of your eyes and be able to represent your organization in a passionate way that actually compels people to give. One of the things that always stood out to me was at two o'clock in the morning and you turn on your TV and you have this little fat kid uh, sitting on the ground with dust and flies around his eyes. And for a dollar a day, you can feed a village for 50 million years. Well, that story is so compelling. The visuals are so compelling that they literally get hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars every year for their cause because they put in place visuals. So if you don't have a videographer, get a videographer. Have them to paint a picture regarding your organization, what your organization stands for, and then post that through television, post that through YouTube, post that through your SoundClouds and, and your other social media platforms to be able to tell the story. People love a good story. Paint the picture, tell the story, be passionate, be emotional, and guess what? People will feel that and they'll support that and they'll give towards that because if you don't believe it, they're not going to believe it. And guess what? We don't always give to people, but we give through people. So sometimes the people that we talk to may not have a heart to give, but you know what? We've realized that they'll tell somebody else. They'll tell Auntie Nim. They'll tell Grandma Nim. They'll tell other people about the work that you're doing. And then through the grapevine, through word of mouth, other people will now hear about what it is that you're doing and they themselves will now start to support it. So be creative, think outside of the box and be able to, as, as Dr. Adele said, money follows ministry. So if this is your ministry and if this is your heart and this is your passion, money will come. Awesome, thank you so much. So listen, it's hard to believe that we are close to ending at 12. We have gotten such awesome information. As each of the panelists was going through, I have identified 27 funding strategies in the chat. So I hope that you all have been taking some notes there. Um, also, just as we, first of all, can we say thank you? to all four of our panelists today. Um, if you have a little clap down there, you can show it, but I definitely appreciate all of them taking their time, sharing their passion, letting everyone hear the work that they're doing and how they have done it. We have been, our desire has been to demystify nonprofit operation. And I, I hope that today, if you kind of came on today, you're feeling a little low, maybe not so sure about what your next direction is for your nonprofit. My hope is that today has motivated you. Um, I hope today, and also that you will connect. I did ask all of the panelists to put their contact information in the chat. Um, and so as we close up, not only for today, but for this summit, one, we're gonna do this again. 
So we hope to do this perhaps in the spring. I'll be working with our team to pull this forward. Before we go, I do need something from you. We're trying to figure out what kinds of services are going to help you best. So you're going to see a pop-up come up now um, of a poll. And what we're asking you to do is to, um, to answer the poll. Um, it, you should see it pop up in just a couple of minutes. And, um, and thanks so much for all the love in the chat. It's been just a wonderful, wonderful time of sharing today. And um, so we're going to put a poll up. We're going to ask you to tell us the top three business development services that you feel like you need help with. So we had yesterday and today. Um, hopefully you've been able to kind of use this as a time to think about your next steps for your nonprofit and SDC consulting and our uh, nonprofit network want to support you in that endeavor. So, okay. I see that there's a lot of information. Great going up in the chat. Okay. Are we ready for the poll? Great. Okay, well, while we're waiting for the poll, the poll is up. Okay, great, thank you. I can't see it, <laughs> I'm so sorry. So you just let me know when it's over. Okay, and I see that you all are starting to answer. I appreciate that. That's great. Because what we're trying to do now is we're trying to help you. We've got a team of nonprofit business consultants. Every area that you see listed there is something that STC Consulting and our nonprofit network business consultants can assist you with. And so it's, it's our honor to serve you and help you grow and develop and fund your nonprofit organizations by helping you build internal capacity to get to the money. That's the road to the money. Okay, we've got eight, all right. Let's take a couple more minutes. And as you are reading, there's a list of things. So if you can't see the whole thing on the screen, you want to scroll down to the bottom of it. And then you're going to just be able to click on three things. And once you click, you need to then hit the submit button. There'll be a button there that will help you put that in. And then we can register your, um, your responses. OK, and I see it now. All right, thanks so much. We got about half of you who voted. We could just get a little bit more feedback and then we're gonna get ready to close down. All right, and we've got a gut response there. Okay, so, all right. So we're gonna go ahead and close the polling. Thank you so much. And um, we can see right there. So everything in the orange is what you say you need help with. And our next uh, activity, I'll, I'll just say as a little something extra from, for, for sharing today, we have actually created a private members Facebook page. So we're going to put that up in the chat. I know a lot of folks are still chatting and sharing. And so there's our link. So if you'll look in the chat, you will see that there's a link 
for Facebook. This starting in 2021, this is going to be a, a paid private member uh, page. Uh, because of your participation, we want to offer membership to you for free. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to get that link. You can go over to our Facebook page. The name of it is STCC Nonprofit Network. So if you are on Facebook, you should be able to connect. You're going to have to, um, you're going to ask us to bring you into membership. There'll be some kind of request button. Thank you. And then we will respond to you. You'll get, when you get your, make your request, we're going to send to you the group rules and ask that you sign a non-disclosure agreement. We're really trying to keep the information that's shared within the group private, our information and yours, because you'll be networking and talking with each other as well as also seeing resources. The page already has some resources on there that we hope will help you. And we're going to be building and growing like your nonprofit. Our business has had to go virtual too. So once again, we want to thank everyone for being a part today, for participating yesterday and today. We hope that this has been a wonderful opportunity of encouragement, education, and inspiration. And we wish you well. You'll be hearing from us soon. And we're also going to be sending a recap too. So that'll be coming out in another week or so as we kind of regroup, put things together, and we'll be in contact with you. So thanks again, everybody. Love you all. Have a blessed weekend. And we'll be talking with you soon. Yeah.